Hi, welcome to GDC and this is our presenter today, David. Yes. Uh, your last name, I apologize. David Diaz. David Diaz. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors for supporting this event and I'm going to leave it with you. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a little bit about the parallels between competitive sport <coughs> and uh, being an entrepreneur. Um, and how maybe those visions come to be, can we figure them out organically? Hopefully, hopefully we can. Um, when I was about, uh, I think both from start off with the dream, uh, I was uh, 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 from a very young age, I uh, playing sport was the only thing that really made sense to me. So I always followed that passion and coming from a boy to a man. Uh, I played in AAU tournaments, traveled the country, played for national championships as early as 12 years old in baseball, and had multiple scholarships uh, for um, cross-country and for baseball coming out of high school, uh, graduate public South in 1990. Uh, but uh, it wasn't always clear that this is what, uh, what I was okay. going to do. My parents uh, got divorced when I was about 10 years old, and my sister and I were latchkey kids. And to me, she did a good job of raising me because she always told me what to do. And I always like to push that in mind. She shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so I guess that's part of the competition started there, you know. Uh, but um, not until about four years later, after uh, uh, running with a couple of different groups, the athletes and a lot of gang members, I uh, decided I came to a crossroads. And I had to figure out which path I was going to take. Uh, I ended up going the, the sport road, and my best friend in high school, I started hanging out with him like a freshman year. Uh, my other best friend, we all had multiple college scholarships, and he actually went and played on CU Boulder on the national championship team, played professionally for a while as well. So that was, I was lucky enough to have a, a, a guy like him come up alongside me. Um, but we had these visions. His vision was always clear. Uh, mine didn't come due till later in, the, in regards to sport. And um, uh, I think it was when I was 18 years old, everybody on my Edenton team had already signed uh, um, contracts to go play at the collegiate level anywhere from the University of uh, Arizona uh, to Mitchell State, uh, George Mason, to various junior colleges in, in the region. So I was around a lot of guys doing a lot of cool things. Um, I, <clears throat> I think it was like about June of uh, June, if not July, of uh, nineteen ninety. I was the last one on that team not to sign. Lamar Junior College shows up, and Brian Hoche was there. I know it's probably my last opportunity to get a scholarship, and that day I ended up going for it before I passed. Yeah, after the game, he comes and speaks to me about um, how yeah, how I'd like to come visit and if I would sign. Uh, we do within a week. And I didn't really understand the magnitude of what has happened and the work that I've been doing over the years. But it started with the vision. It started with sacrifice for that vision and overcoming obstacles along the way. My senior year, I weighed above 20. So I had multiple scholarships for running cross country because that was the body, you know. But for baseball, most of the guys didn't look like me. They were a lot bigger. And it was also the steroid era, so they were twice. Uh, but uh, something somehow that I referred to as magic back in those days, um, now I think it's more universe ancestors. And, um, I see us all as stardust, and we're all uh, have this energy, uh, positive and the negative, to make uh, to really eliminate, or to you know to maybe not be so bright as well too. So we can tap into that, and I felt like I tapped into it uh, uh, young. So I kept on repeating this this pattern, and I kept on excelling at the collegiate level uh, because of it. Uh, the pitching got faster, and the curveballs uh, broke a little bit more hairy and whatnot. But again, it came down to the same principles. How do I do my work? 
And how do I focus on doing something like hitting a 90 mile an hour fastball when I know physics tells me you really should be able to do that? You know, I have like less than the but less than the amount of time it takes me to blink to make a decision if I go here, inside pitch, if I stay closed, breaking ball, or whatnot. All of these things are going on. But if I'm focused on this 90 mile an hour fastball hitting me in the head, the fear's gonna overcome me and I'll freeze, I won't be loose. So I have to stay focused. And I can't let the fear overtake. That's one thing. I can't also go up there without preparing. I have to be ready for that curveball, for that uh, uh, that split finger that drops off a, of a table. But I have to always be thinking fast. Because if I'm not thinking fastball, um, that's going to blow by me again, too, you know, if I'm waiting for the curve. Or, so I have to think to act quickly. And I also know how do you respond when it's about to happen. Um, pivoting to business right quick. Go we'll fast forward 15 years later. I'm an inner city school teacher. I'm actually, at lunchtime, I'm doing the crossword. I'm reading posts. And it's talking about the income, income inequality. And what side am I going to be on in 10, 20 years? My wife and I was also an inner city, inner city school teacher. Was... Um, uh, uh, teaching with me at the time, and I knew with our salaries, it would be hard to give our daughters, we have three now, uh, into, uh, getting them to college, paying for college, but also having enough energy coming home because giving all of my energy to the inner city school kids at Denver North High School, I was coming home on it, and I wanted to save some for my yet to be done. So, it's fall break right around this time, 19 years ago, and I start my quest, and I'm looking for those signs. What would be next? What would be next? So I'm searching, I'm searching. My roommate from college owns a personal training studio in Castle. I drive down there, and no one's in the studio. The, the radio is playing, it's on 11 o'clock, and that's not uncommon for a personal studio, personal training studio, to be kind of dead at that time. He's in the back washing towels, but when I walk in, I get this sensation that I very, really, very rarely felt. And it was like a bolt of light striking me saying, Well, this will be what you do next. So I go home, I talk to my pregnant wife, and I say, I'm changing careers, and we're going to do it. We leverage so far, uh, which means we take out a heel. I invest in. Um, a franchise uh, because at the time my undergrad was in mathematics, my master's was in education. I thought I was going to be a principal, but again, I didn't have the energy for that because I might soon be drowned. So, uh, have the conversation with my wife. She co signs. She's like, let's go do this and take maternity leave. Sophia joins us. And I have five months to figure out how to get it built out. How to get it August of 2005. Sophia is now four months old, our oldest daughter at that time. And after doing the build out, buying all the exercise equipment, investing all of the HELOC, and now have $2,000, which is about enough for next month's rent. And um, already signs uh, notes saying, you know what, well, you guys can have the house if, uh, if I don't make it. So it's really go time. My wife's family comes from, uh, she's South Texas, and her father's out of poverty. And before that, the generation was in the, um, uh, that her family derived from the King Ranch. And they're Mexican American. King Ranch is the biggest ranch in Texas, it's bigger than the state of uh, Rhode Island. Um, but you can work there and live there. They don't pay you, but they'll provide house for you. So, uh, and then she served, you know. They moved out to Kingsville, and her father got a scholarship to play football in Highlands, New Mexico. So that was their uh, club. Um, 
So she understood the importance of chasing different dreams and whatnot and risking it all. So as we're going through this, knowing that there was no money left, I come home kind of rattled. She said, no, I don't know about the sales piece. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the market. I'm worried about X, Y, and Z. And this is with our daughter, you know, saying, oh, okay. Well, I, I hear you, and well, that's good. But that time's coming on. Yeah. We're here now. Let's play with it. You know, she gave me the little pep talk. She's my coach. She went back to uh, nursing Sophia. And a few months later, Solana would come around as well to our second child. And I felt this on the business. Back to staring down that 90 mile hour fastball. I didn't have time for the fear. Does the fear come? No, step. But how do you reset? And how do you tell yourself you do have this? And really, that's what it comes to over and over and over. It's a manifestation that comes through sacrifice. And it comes through not getting, maybe there's a little luck involved to. Maybe there's a little bit of following the signs of which path to take, which employee to hire, which one to get rid of, or which one not to even bring on board. But all of these factors come in to it. And as we're looking at these pieces, I know I'm not the only one with this vision, with these feelings. You know, I've already talked to two people today, and I came because I was at, uh, at work before I got here. And similar things of what they're going through, have been through, or um, will come. But the beautiful thing is, I found a pattern of not just hitting a ball, but opening a business, got it a house. Uh, actually, I believe I helped manifest love as well, not just with my wife, but with our beautiful three daughters. The first one right now is in college. Uh, the second one uh, is, uh, is uh, she has a 4.8. First one is a 4.3. The next one is a 4.8. And we will figure out how to get them through college. There is a college fund. I provide health care for my employees. We own commercial property. <coughs> We're I started off on free and reduced lunch, um, and our assets over the years were now, well, close close to $2 million. And I, and I don't want to say shocked, but when the dream comes to fruition, and you're helping people, you're helping yourself, you're walking the, the same path that you ask people, to believe in themselves, to sacrifice, and hopefully whatever you're building, you're coming from a good place, and the world is yours. It's as, it's as big and it's as wonderful as you dream. Uh, the, I did have one video clip that we were looking to play, and it's from this movie called Nacho Libre. <laughs> is anybody familiar with it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, am, I am, I am. I am, I am. And there's there's a part of it where uh, he's the kids are wrestling, and uh, see if you remember this piece. Uh, but Nacho, for those of you who haven't, seen, has anybody not seen him? Okay, so he's a monk in Mexico. Uh, he's a grown man who has visions of being uh, a professional wrestler, but nobody really believes in him. But he believes in himself. And as he's trying to overcome this dream, you know, if he could share it, because the church looks at it as, as looks at as acts of profession as a, as a sin. So here's a little scene from Nacho as he's discovering his dream. So let's make sure he sees it. We've all seen it. So, Jack Black is there. Yes. <laughs> and he tells him to read some books. But he's coming from a good place for the folks around him. But he overcomes those thoughts that we all have. Have fun along the way. And know that, uh, you know, maybe someday, you know, uh, 
this little boy from Pueblo that didn't come from us. Uh, I'll shave his head, rock a ponytail, and for a hundred bucks an hour, share stories to very fluent people uh, of things like that. I think that's my time. I expected to uh, be more interactive. But, uh, I appreciate you guys for coming in and that's it. Would you mind spinning out if anybody had a question for you? Do you have the time? Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Other than what other scene in Nacho Libre do you really like? <laughs> One thing that I didn't talk about, uh, and if you have to go, I totally get it, but it's, it's not just the competition of the business around you, but within yourself. How do you believe that you're on the right path? And how do you overcome those, those wake-ups at 3 a.m.? You know, how is this and uh, um, one of the big, big things I do is I exercise. I exercise all the time, and I listen to urban poetry. I listen to the the guys that started with nothing and came from something. Tell me a little story that rhymes to a funky beat to help channel and manifest that these things are possible even if I don't have a mentor right there beside me. Uh, maybe I could listen to uh, Notorious Big, It Was All a Dream, Place to Rewrote, Word of Magazine, Salt Pepper in the, in the limousine. His dream for once upon a time and how he became something like that. Uh, uh, maybe he didn't know. The, the other, did you have a question? Does anybody have any stories of like visions or of like all cautious in the call this is when you have it. I do. Um, so <clears throat> I was my political advisor for like 20 years at a private university in Denver and um, I had a back injury and uh that blood vessel that broke in my body and it bled into my lumbar spine and it put me down for a month and a half. And during that time, um I, I couldn't move. I didn't want to look at the phone. I didn't want to do anything. It just lay there. That's <laughs> what I really do. But um, when I was able to start looking at my phone and start being interested in life again, um, I came across this thing that was um, like how to do what you love and put it online and, and teach what you love online. And so that was the beginning of the dream. And it's taken... <laughs> I don't even know when that was. <laughs> it's been like a decade ago. It feels like a decade ago. Um, to now, to almost launch. But it, it was life changing. It was like I can do that, and I can, I can do the things I love to do and teach what I want to teach to students um, without being tied to an institution. And so that dream is now launching, and it's very exciting. And I'm right there with you on the energy sub. Um, the other side of my business is personal energy management and how to manifest the things that you want. Um, and I too am very tied to the ancestors and love um, all my guides and things of that nature. I'm a of you and your that way. But um, it's very helpful. And I get these little downloads and I act on the downloads. And it saves me a ton of time and a ton of money. And things just happen. And I'm living that testimony right now. So, um, like all the things that I, I call the vortex, all the things that I put in that vortex, I'm now seeing um, they're part of my everyday life now. And there was for a while, it's just faith, 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 and keep going forward, keep going forward, and eventually you'll resonate with those things and you'll see them. And, and now that's where I'm at. And so I absolutely understand what you're saying. And it's incredible. It's incredible. If you allow it and you seek it, you will find it. You have to own it. Yes, I think you have to absolutely know that it's yours. And it comes from inside. It's not like something anybody else can make for you. Everybody has to. Yeah, I'd say for myself, I started living on my own at 15 years old and, you know, slept in parks. And I knew it was on me to figure out like whether or not I was going to sink or swim. And, um, 
thankfully I had enough of a brain on my shoulders. I was still going to school. I was going to an art school. Um, and, uh, doing music theater, which definitely helped because it made me laugh a lot. But then really when it was time to find a career, I felt because I never went to college, it just wasn't really an option I wanted to do. And I had three generations of women before me that went to college. So it wasn't something I was exactly being pushed to do. And I just found I loved gardening plants, like plants talk to me and I talked back with them and slowly but surely it was like, okay, you know, I just needed like a truck and a couple of rakes. Um, (laughs) and I started that way. And because I loved what I did so much and I connected with the work that I did, it just grew from there. And 20 years later, I have seven crews, an irrigation department, 40 employees, um, 65 weekly clients plus design and build. And it all just started with just that idea of like, I really love what I do. And I could feel like, it seemed like I, and my in-laws were always like, you know, when are you going to get a real job, you know? And I didn't listen to them because, you know, then my husband started working for me. Their son, who has a very nice education, was working for the Federal Center in the Water Quality Lab as a scientist. And I was like, you don't seem happy. I was like, you want to run the irrigation department? <laughs> and so then he was like, well, when are you going to get a real job again, son? And now we're making more money than all of his college-educated children. Um, multi-million dollar company at this point and it's I resonated with that like you just and there are hard days there are really hard days um but like you have to love what you do that's kind of what I was sensing and take the leap of faith even if it seems scary because if you don't then you never really know whether or not it was possible I don't know but like that's why I liked your natural leave your faith that's what made me think of it's like I could you know let my fears take over. Like I'm not good enough. Imposter syndrome, right? The imposter syndrome. Imposter. Like everyone's like, where? Where did you go to college for horticulture? And I'm like, in gardens and the internet <laughs> and books and the library. And you know, like when people say they don't know, I'm always like, seriously, guys. Like I used to have to go to the library to get the books. You know, and like had to look at a map book to figure out where I was going in Denver. So I don't know. I don't know. I was just adding to the conversation. That's why I helped start Good Good Business Colorado was another one of those wacky ideas. I was like, we could create an organization that actually speaks for small business. 